Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Hi, welcome to uh, Pods with Nick and James. Um, today's subject is going to be about heroes. I've asked uh, Nick to think about somebody he'd like to bring to the table. Um, I'm going to be bringing someone to the table as well, and then we're going to talk about, just have a discussion about why we like them, um, prompt each other with questions, and just try and have a bit of a backwards and forwards. So rather than it being a information dump, I'm hoping it's going to go... Uh, more like a dialogue which is what we'd always I'm pretty sure both of us had always intended the podcast to be more like that yeah um, yeah I'd agree with that yeah um, so without further ado we'll uh, let's let's get into it um, so what I'd want us to focus on today is one person who has inspired us Nick, who is uh, who is the person who has inspired you? Well, I've mentioned this person on the podcast before, and um, it should be no surprise that I mention him again. Um, it's Jacques Fresco. Okay, fantastic. All right, uh, the individual I've chosen is uh, the artist uh, Joseph Mollard William Turner. Um, we'll start, though, with uh, Nick, your one. Um, what can you tell me about... Uh, uh, Jacques Fresco and why has he inspired you? Um, well, um, Jacques Fresco was born in 1916. He died in 2017. Um, he grew up in New York around the time of the Great Depression and he was massively influenced by um, the impact that it had on his family and to him all that he really noticed um, changed was that people stopped going to work. The factories were still there, the materials were still there, um, but for some reason, sociological input um, dictated that you couldn't work anymore. And it caused massive outlay that impacted how he saw the world for the rest of his life, to the point where he um, endeavoured to um, <clears throat> design a um, social system to move us on from previous social systems. Um, he came up with the idea for a resource-based economy um, and what I love about the way that he designed this entire social system is that he didn't just go, oh, I think this would be a great idea. He literally designed the resource-based economy, um, sit political and, and sociological system from the ground up, ironing out all of the kinks and 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 all the flaws that may well come with it. Um, but the best thing about his his mentality throughout it all um, is that he he didn't do it for he didn't at any point do it for personal gain. Um, he did it for the the good of humanity shall we say and he wasn't any kind he, there was no agenda towards any particular race it was for everybody as a human race um, he even says that his um, his system doesn't work with borders it doesn't work with with divides between humanity it's either all or nothing um, and yeah I mean it, it really is an incredible piece of work that he he designed 
during his time alive. Um, and he kept Fantastic professing guy. it all the way up to 2017 when he died. Well, you know what? I, you've got to respect some... But although there is some respect for people who um, are able to change, like there's even more respect for people who stick to their guns. So that's, yeah, fair play to him. Like, I also love the fact that what you've said there is that he made something for everybody else that doesn't benefit him. Like, even even heroes like uh, Alexander Hamilton, who invented a lot of the financial systems within the New York stock market. He was the treasurer of, uh, yeah, of the United States. So, you know, you could argue that their work was still had some self-interest whereas what you said about yeah Jacques is that just he wouldn't have been able to benefit from it at all like yeah. what is with the resource-based economy um does it have other than a resource-based economy does it have any other names that people might have heard of um <clears throat> It, there's, there's, uh, he's designed um, almost like so. His, so the resource-based economy comes hand in hand with um, almost like convents, I suppose, is one way that you would see them now, but they're not designed like that at all. Um, where instead of having um, humans in little pockets all over the countryside, in order to, um, in order to live in a symbiotic relationship with uh, the planet you have a mass city hub of human um, and then nothing all the rest is given back to nature and nature just consumes it um, and flourishes um, and then you interconnect all of these hubs these cities with transport between the two between all of them across the country across the world um, so it went way beyond from way beyond just a resource based economy it went into like designing a holistic um social system um that encompassed as i said a symbiotic relationship with nature which he fully um accepted was the only way that we were going to be able to survive um without um self annihilation was through um working with within the laws of nature and not trying to manipulate nature and and make nature um mold to you well, that's interesting and like that isn't something that um i'd necessarily thought about when designing a social system from the from the ground up um okay what can you tell me about uh about shark and about his i don't know like Although he invented this, did he? Was he university educated or like? Yeah, I mean, he he, he... had um, he was a social engineer. Um, he called himself a social engineer. He worked as an inventor, but his first actual job was working with um, a company, um, an aircraft company. I did make a note of it earlier. One second. Um, it was completely lost it in a month in the midst of all of my notes now but um he worked for a uh an aircraft company they thought that his ideas were too out there and he didn't last but his he the best thing about his designs where they were all like engineered um within reason none of them were like um not achievable but they certainly weren't mainstream um so which is why he he flourished, I think, mostly through freelance work, inventing things and and designing things for people um, specifically. Okay, that's interesting, and like um, I, yeah, it's well, it's good to know that he was able to get the freelance work after being um, ostracized from a company. Um, and I know that that's from my own personal experiences recently that that's not necessarily easy. So, yeah, fair play to him. Um, okay, brilliant. All right, so he worked as a as a would you call it an aeronautics engineer? Yeah, a designer, um, aeron aeronautics engineer, 
and designing okay. on some and of the early aircraft. Still, yeah, and still kept on kind of working in that field. Yeah, freelance, freelance way. Okay, what well, do you do? You think he would like if he was born later and kind of stayed in that field? Do you think he would have worked on like the saber engines? Um, which kind of take jets into space or like kind of worked on any of the SpaceX stuff? No, I don't, I don't think so because a lot of what he, um, a lot of what he designed later on was with the mind to have mass production and with the mind to have ease of production and re remanufacture or, um, remanufacturability. Um, so it wouldn't be like, oh, we'll design this machine that's going to go up once or twice. Um, like he designed um, something in 19, just after the Second World War, um, called the Trend House, which was designed entirely out of aluminium and glass um, with, the, with the mindset for it to be mass produced and for it to be able to be put up in, in like two week time, in a two week time. Uh, time scale and it was one of the first of its kind and was revolutionary at the time um, and everything that he designed in all of the the city structures that he um, built or, or designed um, for a couple of the projects later on in life one of which is the venus project um, was about creating um, easy to produce and and almost um, modular um, um, dwellings and and um, and like shops and things like that that if we needed another one they could just be pumped out of the factory and then delivered to the location and they just dumped into place um, and they didn't look terrible just to, just to clear that up before anybody goes getting it oh that must that must look terrible no 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 his his designs were beautiful and the way that they look in in some of the videos that you can you can see they literally just get plugged into the side of a um, of an upright building uh, but when when you need more when you need more dwellings for for more be more people you just plug another a set of dwellings in the side of a building um, they were it was incredible it was revolutionary but like i said it, it would it wouldn't have worked along the mentality of like um, aerospace engineering or anything like that because it tends to be quite disposable and he was very much about uh, mass produce and, and recyclable and and like I said about creating a symbiotic relationship with nature and you can't do that in quite a disposable mentality mm. is that the um okay so you've clearly like been inspired by um his for his thinking process and the way that he does things like um I don't know um is there anyone else that you can compare him to in history who's been particularly holistic or is this the thing that kind of like sets him apart as a designer as a thinker as a social engineer is this kind of almost all angles kind of covered um if that makes sense ness of his uh i think yeah, there's, there's philosophers method. there's philosophers that have ticked the boxes much the same as Jacques Fresco has. Um, but what you get with Jacques Fresco is, like you said, it's the whole, it's the whole system. It's, it's mm. not just, it's the way of thinking. It's the way of living. Um, it's, he's designed it all. Um, and he's crossed every T and he spent over a hundred years. Um, well, I suppose he spent over 80 years or so developing this, this mentality of, um, symbiosis and the idea of there not being the need for money and as a matter of fact money um, tends to hold back quite a lot of our development um, a lot of our um, ability as a as a race um, and he want he want he wanted to like abolish any kind of um, system that was centered around debt or, or subservience or or servitude it was if if the resource is required and with the resource is available then the resource should be used um, otherwise it shouldn't you know mm. no that's fair because it's you know it's very 
it's very difficult to argue against um if there's a need there's a way to do it and the resources are there then it is simply the ideas of ownership the ideas of debt and the ideas of profit that stop it from happening which i imagine is the very things that kind of like he witnessed um during that uh during the depression in new york okay um hmm is there any uh any materials that you'd recommend uh people uh people watch or people um people check out in order to get an idea of uh well yeah, i Jacques i fresco? first i first heard about Jacques fresco as he appeared at the end of the the zeitgeist the movie um kind of documentary docu film um in for documentary i don't know what you call it um where they discuss um a lot of uh, i suppose some people might call it conspiracist um propaganda but it's it's quite into i I, th I find it quite an interesting topic actually about the 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 beginnings of religion across the planet and the the, the similarities across most religions um and then the impact that money has had across all of the world and how that that goes hand in hand quite often with with financial leverage um, and then right at the end of it they what they did was they posed a solution and the solution was the Venus project that was designed by Jacques Fresco now he had no hand in um, the Zeitgeist movie but the people that did uh, that came up with the Zeitgeist movie um, asked if they could respect for him. Like, asked yeah. if they could advocate the, the Venus project because they thought this is the future this is where we should be going um and he was more than happy for that to be added into the end of this film um so if, if anybody's got time and you want to have a look there's a few of them but definitely start with zeitgeist the movie um otherwise there is a lot of material on the venus project um which is a project that he started in um in florida with um his partner um which is like the startings of this resource-based economy and all of the designs for the cities and things like that. There is actually a place in Florida you can go and see all of the models and everything that he designed personally, um, which would be Fantastic. like that, that that set up, as it were. Well, I really think is. it's always good to have uh, something physical that you can go to. Um, weirdly enough, although I... You know what, I watched the Zeitgeist movie and I was inspired um, at the time, although I uh, disagree with a fair amount of it now, and like just looking at how some of the facts that are shown, but I will admit the quotes from Jacques Fresco that they used, I'm assuming he was the... The old He guy. was an elderly gentleman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so although I disagree with the way a number of facts and a number of statements within the Zeitgeist film... The stuff that I can't argue with, or a, a lot of the stuff that I can't argue with, is weirdly enough the stuff from Jack Fresco. Like I will admit that it's, yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty solid stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, you can I, see I, I, that I he he spent a lot of time thinking out all of the the folly balls and all of the flaws of his his plan, his his system. Um, and mm. when he talks, it's with real um, conviction. conviction. Yeah, exactly, conviction. Um, but yeah. I, I agree. The the Zeitgeist movie itself, there's it peppers a lot of what I can only describe as propaganda with um, liberal fact and and with with poignant ideas just to kind of back up this um, this un, unjustified propaganda that it. it it's replete with um mm. but like i said it is really interesting there is a there is a lot of stuff in there that does kind of provoke thought um well but... th this is the thing as well like i will freely admit like for as a as a conversation starter or as a basis um i think it's actually fantastic at that because at least it does ask the questions well how did religion come about in the first place what are some of the problems with it? What are some of the, you know, like I think, even though I don't necessarily agree with 
maybe where it goes or with the what or with some of the things that it says and you know what like we could even do another podcast or, or just on that film on the whole but like the very fact that it at least bothers to ask the questions or at the very least bothers to put a view or some historical context in like i i think if you watch it and don't question it then i don't think you've got the point of it if that yeah, makes sense yeah exactly exactly yeah i mean i've watched all of the zeitgeist movies um purely because it does provoke the thought even if the questions it's asking um are one-sided um what it does for me is it provokes the thought process that allows me to then um, think for myself and find my own answers um where i i'm not just taking it for granted that that is how things are um mm. and i think that's very important i personally like i'm agnostic i don't i don't necessarily follow, follow a religion i i'm not really sure that i i necessarily believe in what the common conception of god is but i do believe um there's there's something more um however um the thing that really made me go hold on that's really interesting with the zeitgeist movie is where it goes into the money side of things and the very construct of money and how highly flawed that is i'm very logic driven and the whole monetary system is highly illogical um and having that all made very plain and clear in front of me in a movie was like what why how how has nobody noticed this before why is nobody asking this question when it comes to money um when it came to the banks i again although there was some stuff in there that i disagreed with like i did love the fact that they look at how if you create value out of out of nothing either you're saying you're, well first off you are saying that everyone else's money is now worth less because the n amount of resources in the world doesn't change which is why they then moved on to the venus project and it is it's actually quite you know a logical step it does make sense um but i i did like how uh they kind of looked at how just the immorality of creating nothing and then just creating this circulation um I, I guess money in itself is just a tool for the circulation of goods and services mm. but if you if you make money too much of a thing then i don't know yeah like i i did like the 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 historical examples they used like with the court case where somebody um somebody refused to pay uh the mortgage in the on on their house in america and i think this was in the 1800s and the the judge actually went rather than on the side of the banks actually went on the side of the the individual because the individual pointed out that the the money is bookkeeping money and is therefore it's not theirs not not really theirs not really real not really anything and the person made such a good defense for why what the banks were doing was immoral that literally the judge had to end the conversation or end the case with the uh, yep you guys have literally just lied um only god can make something out of nothing mm -hmm. uh he doesn't owe you anything yeah yeah. Um, which is, is, is interesting. Yeah, which okay. you wouldn't get but, nowadays. <laughs> you'd, oh, you most definitely wouldn't. Like, I'm, to be fair, I'm surprised it happened at all, but I'm still happy that it did. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, well, um, with... Yeah, like, what what changes have you... Do you feel you've made in your life um, due to your... Uh, your appreciation and respect for Jacques Cousteau. Uh, sorry, Jacques Cousteau. Is that the am I saying Fresco? It right? Fresco. Fresco. God yeah, damn yeah. it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so there's not. It's difficult because um, when you think about the monumental task of 
changing a social system um, despite how um, how right it feels and how right it it seems to everybody I talk to the power that one person has is minute so what I tend to do is I say um, like knowing is enough if you understand the system um, and you know that it's the right decision to make then all the choice that you have is to continue in the system that we're in until an opportunity presents itself to make the change um, that's necessary to like to move humanity forwards um, because there are too many people that are set on a monetary system now too many people in positions of power because money gives power and therefore the people in the greatest um, positions inside the monetary system are the people with the greatest power and therefore the people most reluctant to make the changes and the people most most um, likely to make the changes are actually the people with the lowest amount of power because they're the people with the lowest amount of money um, so I quite often when I when I talk to people about it I say look just talking about it amongst yourselves is enough um, knowing um, that this is the change that needs to happen within the world um, is enough and that eventually the monetary system will collapse there will be a massive um, occurrence a situation that occurs that allows for a choice to be made and it's at that moment when um, enough of us will need to stand up and say this is what we are going to do and this is how we are going to do it in order for that change to take place um, other than that you still have to survive within the system that is present on earth today so survive survive in the best way that you can um, meld mix be part of the system because to go against the system you render yourself completely helpless and completely powerless. And you can do mm. nothing. You have to um, adjust for now, at least. I love that because that's literally kind of the uh, the opposite that uh, Karl Marx uh, would say. But I actually respect your way a lot more because he he clay, you know he uh, lived within a capitalist capitalist system made money through capitalism and through the selling of papers and but then said that everyone else needs to uh give up all safety for their families uh give in to a huge revolution um and make you know kill be killed make horrible sacrifices i mean if what you want is and then war... he just said good good luck with it yeah, I mean, if, they, if if what you want is war, if what you want is death, then absolutely take Karl Marx's way. Like, bull, bull fist your way, um, or bullhead your way, right into the revolution. Um, but you will meet immense resistance. Um, what you, like, the only real way that you'll move away from the system that we're in is when it is clearly apparent to everybody that the system is highly flawed and broken and needs a radical change in which case upstand the people with the the knowledge that have like a ready-made system to walk into at that moment no. you make a peaceful transition away from a broken system into what could potentially be a great system um, but one thing that Jacques Fresco says, which I've repeated in numerous podcasts in the past, is that every social system that has existed has existed for a reason and has had to exist in order for us to appreciate where we are now and where we need to go. That does not mean that the resource-based economy is the final product. It just means that it's a viable next step. And there may well be further evolutions that we take down the road. But comparative to the system that we currently exist within, um, it is the next step. It is the right step forwards. 
we just need to make sure we take that step at the right time i uh that's a very again this kind of seems to be something that uh seems to be a thing with jack's thought is that that's incredibly enlightened in that saying that uh saying that this is the solution to the current problem but it's not the solution to all problems and therefore will not be perfect in and of itself like just that's uh from a salesman's point of view that's self-defeating from a realistic point of view and from a integrity point of view that's flawless and that's the point uh, isn't it he was not about doing anything for personal gain it was about social gain mm. it was about global gain it was about everybody benefiting from the effort that he put in um and therefore he was free to say those things because they were the right things to say yeah that's fair okay well um thank you for uh yeah explaining a little bit about uh one of your heroes there like that's yeah that feel that's helped uh help me understand a little bit more where where you're coming from and well actually to be fair I, we've already spoken a bit about this before but i think it was yeah it was worth including um on the podcast so yeah no thanks, i appreciate that uh, thank you that. thank um, you what I about yourself that, yeah so i'm gonna be honest with you i think my one is uh not quite as impressive he definitely wasn't as holistic um but i do appreciate the moral stands that uh, this person took so um, my one of my heroes uh, is the painter Joseph Mollard William Turner mm -hmm. um, who was born in 1775 uh, in London and died in um, 1851 um, although it's weird because like uh, I've just heard that he died in 1851 the books that I used to read said that he died in 1850 but Regardless, you get an idea at least of the period of his life. Maybe he um, died on New Year's Eve. Well, he did die late December. You're right. So, like, it, it just do. Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's a gray area. Me. It's a gray. It's area. a gray area. That's it. Which is is weird because he was the upper class of English society by the end of his life. But uh, some of the reasons why I liked him was first off. Uh, I've been, I I like his work. I like his paintings. Uh, I specifically like his later life uh, work and romantic paintings. Um, I also like the morality behind his work, um, which we'll go into in a in a little bit. And then when with artists, you some of the you know you with any bunch of famous people, you get a variety of what they were like in real life and um when compared to other artists whose work i enjoyed like paul gorgon uh, um gorgan sorry um this turner actually seems like a complete saint by by comparison um one of the things that i liked was that he came from a working class family and worked his way up uh, when asked what his secret was, he literally said, my only secret is hard work. Um, he was obsessive and dedicated to, just as uh, Jacques was dedicated to the Venus Project and a resource-based economy, Turner was always obsessed with painting. Like it's what he did from the age of a child to when he was... Um, a apprentice uh in a, to an architect to when he got his own studio to when he became uh part of the royal academy to when he became professor at uh the royal Acad professor of perspective um at the royal academy all of these things were pursuing excellence in one field in one thing which to him was landscape painting um he overcame a number of obstacles in his life. Uh, his mum, unfortunately, uh, ended up going to St. Mary Bethlehem, uh, sorry, the famous asylum. Yeah. St. Mary Bethlehem or Bedlam. 
Yeah, bedlam. Um, which is where the where the word bedlam comes from. Um, when he was still still a young man, um, and I really uh, yeah, so I just really respect that pursuit of excellence. Um, the fact that he um, founded the Turner Prize, uh, that he invested his money in a number of um, charities for supporting um, under under successful artists. Um, uh, yeah, just he, he, and then also just the fact that he, I hate to say it, the fact that he was English born and bred said that had traveled all across Europe and yet said that the, the best skies in all of Europe are those in Margate, which, uh, is not something you'll hear repeated nowadays. <laughs> no, I bet it's not. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is why the Turner Contemporary is, is built in Margate. Do you reckon um, that's why they built Dreamland in Margate? Mm, I think uh, I think Margate was something else in his time, um, and yeah, you know what? The short answer is no. The more <laughs> I dig on this one, the more I'm going to be digging down. So just moving swiftly on um, on that one. Uh, but yeah, that's what he inspired me to do was to paint and try new things, to work hard at achieving goals. So he's kind of like one of the reasons why I did an art degree and why I worked hard. Like I'd show up to the studio space, no one else was around and I'd be writing in my textbooks. I'd be painting, I'd be doing all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of other people, um, still got better grades than me because genuinely they were better and more talented but he he had a, a good work ethic and I felt he was a really good example um, of somebody who's dedicated to a single thing um, I like it, I'm a terrible artist myself and I can barely draw a stick man without feeling like I've done a terrible job, however I like my three daughters are all incredible artists my partner my wife is an incredible artist and um yeah she like they all um, can see things in in images like in their head even before they even put it on paper that i i can't i can appreciate art that has been drawn and that has been painted and i'm one of those people that will stare at a painting for hours and lose myself in all the intricacies of of the brush strokes etc but could i achieve it i think maybe that's why i i i find it so remarkable is because i know it's beyond my capabilities well this is this is another thing that i loved about him um at several points he saw other artists work um okay so i guess this is the weird thing about turner I'm looking back at it, how he was with people. I'm pretty sure he was autistic. Like, not just mildly, like, ma massively autistic, if I'm honest with you. Like, high-functioning mm. autistic. Like, he is reported to have broken down in tears um, at when going to particular shows uh, as, a, as a teenager and seeing certain works. And when asked why, it was just, it, he would say things like, well, because I know that I can't do that um, and never will be. And, he, you know, he proved himself wrong on several occasions. I doubt but, he thought uh, that. Well, he apparently, he, he may not have fought it eventually, but uh, he, uh, I don't know, I'm just going by the reports of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, what I will say is, going back and researching him in his private life, um, I will admit he was not a perfect person. Uh, he... Um, I don't know, like, it's it's almost not even worth mentioning nowadays, but, like, he never married, so he... He never married, but he put on a pseudo name, so he pretended to be married, but never did like there's a 
Maybe yeah, it was you know to save would... himself from the embarrassment of not being married in no, a society p- where it wasn't normal to not be married. Yeah, I think I, I get that sense with him. Like a lot of his, he was ahead of his time, um, and he, like, he was a devout atheist as well, and like he, he, he did speak up and he did do a lot of. He did a he he. He was a patriot. He was an atheist. He was not necessarily a revolutionary. Um, he did have an appreciation of technology. Um, I guess one of the reasons why I also really respect him is the one thing that he did speak up on massively um, in at least one of his works. Uh, so my favorite work of his is Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying, which is a massive... Um, one one and a half, sorry, like seventy five centimeters about uh, high to one and a half meters wide protest uh, about slavery, and although his mum went to, you know, was put into a sane asylum, he didn't make works about mental health. He didn't make works about individual government policies that he disagreed with. He didn't make works about the, um, yeah, about the degradation of London life or about the struggles of the working man, even though he never lost his own um, working class accent. He made one major political work and one major political statement and that was to do with the events of um slavers whose slaves were covered for drowning um but not for sickness uh throwing sick slaves overboard and just the moral repugnant of it and the image is uh, is quite repugnant, is quite violent is in, in itself, but it's, I don't know, it's a very captive image. So, um, yeah, well, listen to check you, out. Um, if you chuck the, the title for the piece um, mm. in a message after, I will post it on the Reddit. So, people, viewers, if, Fantastic. You're, if you're listening, head over to the Reddit and uh, there'll be a Brilliant. link for the works on there. No. No, the work itself is one of the few ones that was sold to uh, America, um, despite Turner being English and a lot of his work being in the National Gallery and in the Turner Contemporary. Mm. Unfortunately, this one is in the New York uh, National Gallery. Or, well, sorry, New York isn't a city, but you know what I mean. It's yeah. the National Gallery in New York has this painting, um, and it is a. I guess you know what it's to do with the slave trade, so it is to do with American history. Yeah. Um. So yeah. All right. That's why. That's that's my guy. Um. Thank you for <laughs> listening to that little rant. But no, no. He, I can it's, see why yeah. he he was quite obviously somebody that um, walked his own path and mm. wasn't afraid to um, to support those around him um and i can see the the effect that he's had on you um i know from personal experience that i i personally account my aptitude with my current job um partly culpable um to yourself so i can see that that um, helping mentality has been um probably quite like heavily inspirational for yourself um but also yes yeah, a bit of a visionary part of it. as well well just to be fair although i d- we won't go too much backwards and forwards whilst on this whilst we're recording you're good at your job because you're good at your job nick like that that's i might have done my best to show you what i know but you, you, your talent is very much your own um although i do appreciate the shout out all the same no, the point is that it was you were you were you didn't think of it as a hardship. As a matter of fact, you trained 
a number of staff whilst I was working and you never once complained about having to train a new member of staff um, and that in itself is um, is reflective I... of the influence that that Turner had on you true true uh, although I, I will admit I also personally enjoy sharing information it's another reason why we're doing this podcast absolutely absolutely yeah. um so are there other pieces um by turner that you would you would suggest that the oh absolutely listeners... um although although i'm not a massive fan of his earlier work as you can still see the um the architectural draftsman in him um the the fighting timorera um is an amazing piece uh the rise of the carthaginian empire uh the fall of carthage uh two kind of sister pieces which uh are historical as historical painting had more elevation back in the 1800s um hannibal crossing the alps isn't necessarily my favorite piece of his but it's another very famous uh one of one of his like any of, I, I'd recommend any of his later work if you're if you're looking for um, amazingly expressive, uh, but not quite surreal um, paintings. I'd I'd recommend any any of those. Uh, yeah, in fact, actually, I'd say the the Fighting Timorera is like one of my one of the uh, possibly my second. Uh, yeah, my second favoritist of his is uh, yeah, just the colours. Uh, that one is in the uh, the National Gallery. So if um, you have the chance memory. to go to the National Gallery, then then go check that out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I as I said, I I can appreciate. Oh, I don't know a lot of Turner, which probably shows my lack of culture. Um, but. Um, I personally, uh, Van Gogh is probably one of my favourite artists. Uh, oh, his, absolutely. His story, um, as well as the art he presented, um, is absolutely fantastic. The man was replete with mental health problems and and displayed that within his work so beautifully. Mm. Um, he was a very troubled man. Um, and... The... No, it's it, it's you're absolutely right, and it's kind of like there's still mystery around Van Gogh's death. Like, yes, the coroner report said that, or you know, the police report says that he shot himself, but then <laughs> ballistic experts have looked at it and looked at the angle of the shot, and you know, some people have said that, oh well, he couldn't have done that without breaking his hand using the weapon that that was used. So it's kind of like, oh well. Was he shot and then covered up for the people who had shot him? Um, it's. I mean, knowing the the mental health troubles he had, he may well have been maybe may may well have asked um, somebody to take care of business for him. Um, mm. Like knowing that he wasn't able to do it himself. This is the same man that cut his ear off and gave it to his his love um, just so that she had a piece of him. Um, it, it, incredibly twisted but at the same time incredibly beautiful <laughs> so you know you, you can't understand the mind especially given the fact that it's long gone um, mm. but what is left behind is is some of the most incredible artwork um, no absolutely absolutely like I do uh, I do love his skyscapes but then again I'm I'm a sucker for the skyscapes which also feature heavily in Turner's work. Um, I, I do wonder whether or not there was a lot of drug use when it came to Van Gogh, though. <clears throat> not because, uh, um, not because I think of him as a drug user, but because, um, like the the imagery. the imagery is highly hallucinogenic. Um, mm. It's incredibly hallucinogenic, um, mm. and the way that you can, I mean, if you stare at um, a Van Gogh piece for long enough you almost feel like you're falling into it um, and that I think has got some kind of um, like some kind of hallucinogenic effect I suppose um, 
the fact that he was able to capture that, if that was on, if that was what he saw whilst he was under the influence of hallucinogenics, and he was able to capture that in art form, that's absolutely amazing. Um, no, yeah, absolutely right. No, he is, um, he is one. Or <laughs> he's not. Although Turner is my is my favourite painter, Van Gogh is up, is up there as well. Yeah, freely admit. Um, also, I I think a lot of people did take drugs i don't think there was quite the same stigma um i think if you let your your life fall apart then there was stigma attached to that but i know you know um turner was actually uh an opium addict um but handled his addiction um and kept it mostly out of the private eye or sorry public eye so um i don't know i think the Kind of part of the the war on drugs has been this demonizing of its use um by people or or kind of like making it you know what that in itself that is a is whole, also another topic that another is topic. another topic absolutely um, but yeah oh yeah. i'm uh i'm really happy with this conversation i've learned i've definitely learned a thing or two um i'm probably am going to go back and watch uh some of the zeitgeist movies i'll uh i'll send you some uh some of the titles of uh of turner's work and we'll take it from there yeah. uh, listeners i hope you've learned something too and um yeah you know send us a comment um let us if there are any topics that you would like to hear us talk about uh please let us know have a good evening and have a good weeks thank you for listening take care